was a dark and stormy night, nor'easter rolling in. It's a long twelve hours, the power's out again. I pray for inner strength and that we don't lose no lives. Just another day in the first responder's eyes. Half a cup of coffee's gone, the first run comes in. A car slid off the road, there's a family trapped within. My heart beats like a hammer, I can barely catch my breath. I'm thinking the worst and hoping for the best. difference and the first on every scene it's a heavy heavy burden to carry all this burden when you can't unsee the things you've seen it keeps going on when those sirens are gone My shift is finally over I gotta deal with what's mine And try to find a way To leave those tragedies behind So I hug my two children A kiss on my wife Just another day The first responder's life First on every scene It's a heavy, heavy burden To carry all this burden When you can't unsee The things you've seen It keeps going on When those sirens are gone The first on every scene And it's a heavy, heavy burden To carry all this hurting When you can't unsee The things you've seen It keeps going on When those sirens are gone Hey, welcome to the award-winning Mad Radio Show with John and Sam, your first responders network into healing our heroes through resources and um, and workshops. Welcome, Sam. How are you? Hey, it uh, was another crazy week out there. I know. Uh, I'll tell you, what, there's so much to talk about tonight, but uh, you know we've got to compartmentalize and <laughs> um, I'll, I'll say stay sane because. You can go down a road and never come back. <laughs> hey, just real real quick. Um, I know you were in Oklahoma. I'd like to hear just a little bit brief on that because I, I heard you had a fantastic experience. Yeah, so I am a, a brand new board member to a fantastic organization that we are going to have on the show at the end of the month called Heroes on the Water. They're already part of uh, our workshops that we do for first responders. And uh, there was a board retreat in Tulsa. And uh, first time I got to go kayak fishing and really be immersed in uh, what they do, the 
recreational therapy for our veterans and first responders is becoming more and more popular. And there is a reason for that, because when you are on a kayak, you know, working with your fishing rod, trying to catch fish, I caught two. Yeah, I was going to ask you. Yeah, I did. I caught two fish. Little, little bluegills. So we don't, we, it's, you know, catch and release. Um, that's what you're focused on. You're not really thinking about, uh, you know, you don't, your head doesn't get to go into bad places and you're surrounded with people that have been there. They get it. They understand. Um, and it was especially poignant uh, this weekend uh, based upon what's going on in Afghanistan. And I, I just want to start off the show because, John, we have had and spoken to many a veteran now first responder, whether they are police officers or firefighters. Um, you and I did not serve in uh, Afghanistan. We cannot even begin to imagine uh, what you all went through. But the TBIs, the post-traumatic stress, that part we do get since right. we both you know, have it ourselves. And we just want to say, I just want to dedicate the show to them because the way that this is being handled is so wrong. I, I am sending out, John and I both, we are just, we're praying for you seriously. If you need to talk, please reach out. We are here to listen uh, and you, you should not be reliving and I, I can only imagine the level of yeah. anger that uh, a lot are, are going through. I connected with and, and did uh, spoke to a lot on Facebook today and just let them know, hey, I'm thinking about thinking about you. Reach out if you need to, um, because it's like, you know, I, I, I everybody that lost limbs, that lost, you know, uh, moms and dads that lost their kids you know, their sons that were fighting their daughters. It's like, for what? Uh, so w I, I know I don't need yeah. to apologize, but on behalf of the Americans on this country that actually believe in the mission, the patriots. what you guys were doing over there, the real patriots of this country, we are behind you 100%. We do not agree with the way this is going down and uh, are just, our hearts and, and and our prayers go go out to you. And so yeah. it was like I said, very poignant this weekend because we got a chance to talk. Right. And you know, people got um, to just get it off their chest and yeah. It you know, when you said you immersed yourself in the uh, um the the aspect of uh heroes and awards, it was, it was almost like when we went to um our watch and mm -hmm. we were able to to feel that that dynamic um in the equine uh, therapy, you know, these therapeutic uh, alternatives to the couch are amazing ways to release inner, uh, inner trauma and, and start to begin healing. And I can't, I can't um, stress enough that if you're feeling the, that the couch does not work for you, um, there are so many other resources out there. And like Sam just said, getting out on the water, with uh, uh, heroes on the water and going fishing or going to equine therapy or going mountain climbing or yeah. doing something with, with like-minded people who have, who've been there with you. Um, you it, couch therapy is not, all, is not for everybody. Some people, yeah, but not for everybody. And if you feel that that couch therapy is not working, then you know what? Maybe we try something else. There's always some little thing that you're going to find that, is going to begin that healing process within you um, because everybody is different. Everybody's effects are different. Everybody's brain is different. Everybody processes things on, on a different level. So that's why PTSI is so complex um, in the treatments of it, that that's why so many resources are available. And so many of these great organizations out there are uh, helping our heroes heal um, through these different uh, procedures. Yeah, it, it really is. Yeah, the recreational therapy is is I, I highly recommend. Um, even if uh, call it traditional therapy is working, it is a way to be out in nature and connect with things that are just bigger than you, and realize that you know we're these little tiny we're these little tiny people in this 
huge big <laughs> world, but that there yeah. is something bigger and it's always there. And when you need to rely on it, um, it's there. And and it's just a beautiful and it gets your and it gets your body moving. It gets your body moving oh, yeah. and, and, and the blood circulating and what that also does, it releases uh, chemicals into your brain mm -hmm. that also begin the healing process. Yep. So there's a lot of great benefits on um, outdoor therapy and um, and recreational therapy. So if you haven't heard of it or if you haven't even tried it, make the phone call. At the end of the show, you'll see all our resources that we have available to you. They're partners with us. Please reach out to them. Look at their websites. And um, you never know. Maybe the first two don't help, but the third one will. So let's let's heal all together. Yeah, and you know what's really cool is the family is included as well. Yes. So there were veterans with their spouses and, and their, their kids. We had two youngsters, pros. I'm like, how does this work? How does this work? They're just like, let me go on the kayak. <laughs> hey, was and, that the first time you were ever on a kayak? No, I've been on a kayak before. I've just never been kayak fishing. I've never utilized it to to fish, and it, it was now, really cool. Now, is it, tell explain the difference. I mean, you're kayaking, but now to kayak fish, you gotta you gotta get out there, right? And then then you so you, gotta pull. you know kayak. So you have the some of them are propelled by by foot pedals, and but I, the old fashioned. But you sit on top. There's few kayaks that you're like down in, but it's mostly okay. sit on top, and you have places for your poles and, and stuff like that. So it's um, a little bit of a different kayak. I mean, I'm no, I'm no expert from being out there, but the fact that we got to spend time with veterans and the families uh, is what made the difference and seeing the, the kids smiling faces and everybody just being open to talking and, and sharing. And I think it, it, it fits exactly with what our guest tonight has been doing for a, uh, you know, for many years, um, she is a licensed clinical psychologist in the state of California. Uh, she's a member of a first responder family and a sister to three law enforcement officers, and she's married to a firefighter. You go. <laughs> she's a uh, so she's a very proud fire spouse, and uh, very interestingly, she did her dissertation. And in the subject matter, she got to interview uh, officers, spouses of officers, and adult children of officers to better understand the impacts of police work on the law enforcement family unit. Um, she completed her postdoctoral training, providing treatment to law enforcement personnel and their family members. And she's had the opportunity to go on a lot of ride-alongs, attend live training for emergency responders, uh, which has been helpful in developing an understanding of the day-to-day -day challenges of uh, the job. And in October 2018, she released uh, her book, The Firefighter Family Academy, A Guide to Educate and Prepare Spouses for the Career Ahead. And then in 2019, she opened her practice, First Responder Family Psychology. So we want to welcome back to Mad Radio. It's been a while. She's been super busy growing her own family. There Michelle you go. Uh, Zemlock, welcome back to Mad Radio. It's great welcome to see back. you. Let's thank you. Girl. Yes, thank yes. you. I looked back. The last time I was here was May 2020. So right. uh, wow. I was I was pregnant, but probably not 12 weeks yet. So I hadn't talked about it. So since I've seen you, I've gone through a full <laughs> pregnancy, <laughs> newborn chaos. I have a three year old and she's now almost eight months. So I have a three year old and an eight month old wow. at home. And here I am. And running a full practice. And running a part-time practice. Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, part-time practice, but everything that you're doing but that we're going to talk about, yeah, yeah full-time. Absolutely. And Sam, and what gets me is she still has a smile on her face. <laughs> she, she's got an eight-month-old, and she's got this, she's got the world, all these problems coming on her. And look at her. She's glowing, and she's smiling. She's like, Oh, this is great. Listen, <laughs> it is fire season in California. Okay. It's hit hard. My spouse has just reached the point of being gone more days than home this month uh, with all the force bags. And this is why I'm smiling because 
Yes, he was forced back today. He was supposed to be home to watch them during this, but we had family coverage. So do you hear my office? It's quiet. Quiet. <laughs> It's like, that is why I'm smiling. And, you know, the grandparents are helping out. Oh, it's it's oh, wow. awesome. Yeah, my my son's grandma lives right up the street from us. So uh, I definitely know how that is a huge mm -hmm. help. And John's dogs will just bark. So they'll probably <laughs> fill in for the noise. And then his dogs yep. often cause my dogs to bark. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Looking for where it's coming from. So We'll make up with that. Hey, well, let's dive right in because there's a lot to talk about. I okay. uh, want to let everybody know that the comment stream is open and live. So if you have any questions, go ahead uh, or comments, go ahead and post it um, there. And uh, mm -hmm. we'll make sure that um, Rochelle gets them and has an opportunity to to answer them. And uh, you you just start off by saying it is fire season. Yeah. Um, with everything going on in the world, I, I, I would say there's been a little less coverage and it is it is massive. Uh, yeah. We're even hearing at least the last what I heard is in certain areas, people are absolutely refusing to leave their homes as we you know. So like yeah. if it's stress enough to fight the fires, but then yeah. it's like, come on, citizens, help us out. Yeah, I, I'll tell you, uh, I focus on what's happening with the families because that's who I'm serving. And as a spouse of a first responder, I think it's important to have good boundaries around all the other stuff, all the news, because if I pay attention to like what you're talking about in the news, I can get really wrapped up in the worry around what's going on, what my spouse or people who, you know, other firefighters who've been sent out what they might go through so i try to practice really good boundaries around news during this mm -hmm. season as a way to self-preserve so that i can focus on what's important for our family and of course families in my practice sure. now what you just is brought your, up is, is your spouse coming home though and like uh, you know letting uh, you know what's well, go ahead, finish. He is coming home because uh, he has not been sent out. But what happens is there's certain, you know, fire that sent out, but then that leaves 30 open positions. So everyone who stays home just gets mandatory back kind of over and over again until there. So whether your spouse is gone or here, it's like there's just a ton of overtime and mandatories and you think you're going to see them and you don't. So you just kind of have to have a certain mindset that like they're gone. I need to figure it out. I need this support. Having family around is like um, a must as, you know, a first responder spouse, but definitely a fire spouse during this season. So it's so helpful because um, I wouldn't be able to have work outside the home if not. Right. Right. Rochelle, I mean, the, what you brought up was the boundaries with the news. Yeah. That, 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 that when we talk about, post-traumatic stress, we talk about the stress of a family member, the news is, plays a really key role in what what a lot of husbands and wives go through who have spouses on the jobs. How do you get into that mental mindset to to be able to turn that off? Because I'm sure there's a lot of spouses out there that'd be like, you know, when, they're, when their husband goes to work, they they need to turn on the news, they need to see what's going on. You know, yeah. we're in, a, we're in a, um, the world of social media, so... Yeah the the alerts on the phone how do you yeah. bring yourself into that mental mindset to give yourself a little that boundary that peace yeah i definitely i talk to spouses a lot about that a lot in preparing for fire season because it's like here it comes your anxiety uh, you know first responder families every member of the family is more likely to have anxiety we know that from research so spouses it's the same with you know uh veterans and it's, it's like the spouses the kids are all at a greater risk for anxiety so we don't want to raise that as much as possible. So during moments like this, whether it's, you know, the protests and the riots or it's fire season, it's having very like um, not just allowing things to take over your day, but for you to decide when and what information is important for you to have and when it's important to shut it off and be present. Right. That's how you kind of preserve yourself. And so uh, it, it's not it's news. It's social media. It's uh friends and family members who might want to talk about it every time they see you, or maybe they reach out with a text about it. Um, it might be, um, 
you know, you see it everywhere, right? So it's, right. it's like you really have to find a way to decide what are your boundaries and make sure that um, some spouses, and I say this, everyone's different. Does it raise your anxiety or does it help you feel in control? Because some people will say, I need to know because it helps me feel in control, but really they're very anxious and then they can't sleep at night and they can't right. be present with their. So you really have to know that about yourself. No, I can still sleep. I just, you know, I feel better knowing where they're at. Like, okay, but you really got to do a check, right? Like, right. does it leave you riled up afterwards or does it right. calm you down? Right. Absolutely. And it, so is that when you're, when you're preparing for preparing families for fire season. I know you've got um, uh, a blog, like a yeah. regular blog that goes out. Are you doing this like in a group setting or are you doing this like virtually? I know you're in California, so yeah. I don't know how uh, we're in Texas. So things are not as restrictive yeah. to being in person. How, how are you preparing them? Yeah, uh, exactly. So a lot of virtual events have taken place and different organizations will kind of bring me in and say, hey, I have this, you know, my audience that I talk to and I'd like to provide them with, you know, this talk of like preparing for fire season. And I kind of start talking about that in May because, you know, June starts rolling around. And for me, it's like all the departments around then are preparing for wildland training, right? They're doing, they're getting all their gear out. They're going out and doing wildland drills, all these things. And it's like, okay, if the department is preparing for what's to come, why are we not preparing at home as a family, yeah. as a spouse, preparing your kids for what's to come? Because it's like, if we can, you know, predict it, right, then we can prepare for it and yeah. try and manage it a little bit better. So I did some, you know, virtual talks. We, um, we, I did do one uh, in person, just in, it was outdoors, but to get fire spouses from that area who wanted to connect together. Um, I have had one department, uh, which maybe we'll talk about, but one of the our very large departments in California, the largest has brought me in on a more regular basis. Uh, and that was one of the talks that we did for the family. And this department is spread out across California. So it's actually really hard to connect those families because they're so far spread out. So virtual is actually a real perfect way to get them connected and to know that like, oh, we're part of the same department, even though we're seven hours from each other, right. you know, because they don't get to see each other. So uh, yeah, so it's many different avenues. And you, I do have a video that I send out as well for those who can't make those talks. Now, with the fires so so uh, prevalent in California, mm -hmm. you have a lot of outside help from firefighters from different states that, um, you know, those, those spouses are not really privy to this. They don't know what mm -hmm. a wildland fire is, especially some of those that were coming in from Texas or Louisiana or even as far as New York to go help fight these fires, what would you say to them? I mean, because they are anxious that now they're 2,000 miles away, 1,000 miles away from their spouse in, yeah. in, in, in an atmosphere that they have no control of. Yeah. And, you know, I think we we live, it's, it's similar and different. It's similar in the sense that, you know, when my spouse is gone, he's gone. Like there's no coming home, right? It's like eight hours and, you know, a flight away is kind of the same in this moment, right? Sometimes they don't have reception and you just don't hear from them for a couple of days. What I learned very early on is the news wants to make everything exciting. And when you're a spouse at home, you don't want excitement. You want very dull, boring information. So, Getting the information from your spouse is probably the best way because they're going to be talking about the most exciting thing that's going on, but your spouse could be doing something totally different that has a very different risk associated to it and never a part of anything like that, right? And so like to know that not everyone's doing the same thing. There are many, many jobs and to just like when you do talk to your spouse, like you can kind of get a sense of that and, and really the ins and outs of what they're doing, right? Also mm -hmm. keep yourself distracted. It's not helpful to just be thinking about the what ifs. Anxiety is what if. It's what if about what we cannot control. So to, you could do what ifs all day long. 
you know, but we could do that with any of their jobs at any right. moment, right? It's not right. any different. So it's just kind of making sure that you, you, you're you keeping distracted. I do imagine that those families have more of a choice in versus like California firefighters. There's a lot of them that feel like they'd have very little choice once everyone's getting sent out and then they get back and more get sent out and get, it's like, it's hard to miss being sent out sometimes. Right. And so you have less of a choice and it lasts maybe a lot longer. So we while you're, while you're doing the, the virtual events for um, the, the spouses, how, how do, how do the kiddos, um, you know, cause we'll have fire families, kiddos of all ages. How, how does that play in? And with your programming, do you mean them being there or talking about the well, kids? Some, some, like what's the age? Them. Yeah, that you think okay. is appropriate for um, a child to be brought into the conversation. Okay. And then how would um, you know? Most likely, it's it's the spouse at home that's going to yeah. relay the information. To, yeah. To the child, how does that work? So when I'm talking to families about preparing for fire season. I talk about it in May because you usually the firefighters are still around at that point. And what I hope is that the whole family can prepare and address things because the, the hard part about the spouse is that this is what is the common experience. It's coming, it's coming. The weather's getting warmer in California. All the spouses are getting anxious, like, oh gosh, here it comes. The first call comes in, you know, 3 a.m. and you're going, oh, great, here it is. And they're like, oh, I'm on my way to blah, blah, blah. And then you're like, OK, I don't know when I'm going to see them again. What am I going to do for daycare? What am I going to do for this? What pickup? What do we need to cancel? And everything just falls on you as a spouse and you feel very alone. You're just trying to figure it all out. They're gone. You know, they can't help. And so when I'm talking to fire families in the beginning, I'm saying we know that's coming. So like, let's do it now as a family. Let's talk about what do we need in place? What systems, what help do we need? Do we have family help? And yes, you can just be like, oh, we have family. But to actually give your family tools. Hey, if my husband goes out, here's what would be helpful. These are the two days I work. I'm going to need pickup on those days. If you go to the grocery store, please just keep me in mind and call me and ask if there's anything I might need. It's really hard to get to the grocery store with two little ones, you know, by myself in these times. So it's right. like, it's really like thinking through the daily schedule together as a partner, right? Mm -hmm. And then that firefighter can help because you're first responders. First responders want to know that their family is okay. Like at the end of it, the, they're gone and they're absent and they're helpers and they love their family the most. And so it's hard for them to know that their job is having such an, a significant impact on their family at home. I do this work sometimes with couples and therapy. Like, let's talk about fire season. Here it comes. What's it going to look like? And then we think through that process all together. I will tell you the first responder is more relieved sometimes than the spouse because they're like, oh, thank goodness. Like, I don't have to carry that burden of like, great. Now they're at home and they're just miserable. Right. And so it's like getting them on the same page, getting a whole like plan knowing, hey, you're going to sign up for Instacart because you're just not going to go to the grocery store. You're just going to have things ordered to the home. Like, I'm yeah. out. That's fine. You know, so whatever it is for that family, they come up with a plan. The kid, you know, you'd ask what age, all ages. It's just going to be a different conversation. Uh, I think that teenagers have probably been living it for, oh, you know, the, the, their life. So they're kind of expecting it and know. But I think that they can, the conversation around that could be, you know, how are you feeling about this? What's going on for you? Do you have any worries? Uh, and then talking about responsibilities. In these situations, like I always want to try, this is such an uncontrollable event, which a lot of first responder work is, right? So our kids, anxiety can kind of stem from feeling like you can't control your environment and it's kind of scary and dangerous stuff, right? So when we can't control that, we wanna find control in other places. So sometimes it's trying to help your kids find control and not using those words. So for uh, you know teenagers, it might be like, hey, you know how this goes, I'm gonna be gone, this and this, it's gonna be hard. Maybe you're talking about the events you're gonna miss. Maybe they just started baseball or maybe they, you know, there's things. And so you kind of talk about, this is gonna be really hard for me, but. This is what I want to know. I don't want you to hold back on if you get this or this. 
you know, send me a video or, you know, have, you know, a mom send me a text message or some like, like have a way to connect about those really important things to teenagers. You're starting your first day of right. high school. I might miss it. Like, please remember everything and tell me about it. You know, like just making sure that like, it's not just like I'm gone and I just don't care about what's going on at home. And then to give the teens, I'm going to need some help. I usually take on this task and this task, mowing the lawn. Can that be your task? Can you, can I count on you to do that? Right. Because then they take some ownership in, I got to do this thing. So I can't control what dad or mom is doing out there, but I can control this right here. This is my task. I can mow the lawn. I can make sure I do these things. And then when they come home, I can tell them about it. Right. So maybe for teenagers, that's it. And for little ones, it's the same thing talking about worries or just talking about what do you think? Here it comes, a oh, fire season. And you don't like, you don't want to lead them down a road. Are you really scared about this? You know, you want to let them talk. It's a leading question in court. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know this. Yeah. Police, police probably yeah. get this more than firefighters, yeah. right? But, but you don't want to like lead them on. You just want to know where they're at. Some kids will say they're really worried and scared and they're not going to be able to sleep. And other kids are going to be like, whoa, so cool. Like the, the helicopter is going to come and drop off. So you just let your kid go with where they're going to go with it. If they're maybe the worrier or they're mad about it or they're sad, you start talking about some coping skills. What are things that make you feel better when you're feeling really sad or you're feeling really scared? And you could start to make a list of them now in May before it comes so that when they're worried and scared, predicting it, right? You go, oh, remember, we knew this was gonna happen. Let's do some of those things we talked about before, right? And if they're excited about it, then you just kind of let them go with that. And then maybe with those kids, you know, the parent can give them tasks to take on. Like, oh, I'm going to need your help, buddy. Like, you're going to have to be here with mom and do this thing for me, you know, and just kind of let them go. Oh, yeah, I can take this on. What's a good what's a good age? What's a good age in a first responder, firefighter or police officer or, or any first responder, medic um, to start conditioning your child into those roles? Maybe not so much fire season, but to start conditioning them saying this is our family yeah we are we are a first responder family these are things that you may see you may hear you may you may worry about what's a good processing age for a child to start understanding and how do you approach that and let them play with your handcuffs first <laughs> that's what, that's what you know, I, I hey, the tools of the trade they come home hey, but, you know my son when he was a little what's these for mom? And you know, you just start yeah. a conversation. Believe it or not. I did that with my, uh, with my daughter when, uh, um, not the gun, just yeah, saying on no, putting that out there. Really? Not that, what, not the what I did with my gun was, um, I sat with her and I think she was maybe four or five years old. And I, I put the, I made sure it was clear and I put the gun out on a bed and I said, play with it, take it apart. Let me show you it. I took the whole curiosity aspect out of, out of the gun and I told her the gun safety and, and how dangerous it is. And then it, after a while, and two things happened with my daughter after I conditioned her was she would never hug me when I got home from work. She would say, go put your gun away, you know? So I'd go put my gun away. And one day we were sitting at the house and one of her friends wanted to see, see my gun. It was, it was in my drawer. They were in the house. They were young. They, she wanted to see my, they wanted to see my gun. So my, my daughter played sick. And sent the kid home. And I was like, she came out in the backyard one day. She goes, she goes, I'm, her, her friend left. And I was like, why? What's the matter? She's like, well, I told her I didn't feel good. I said, are you feeling okay? She goes, no, but they were pressuring me to see your gun. And I know that is off limits. So I started mm -hmm. around five years old and, I, and, and it worked. And I'm wondering if that was the proper age to start doing that. I'll I'll be, <laughs> yeah, that worked. I'll be honest. I think that first responder family is like it it's so much of your identity because your whole schedule your fam, your weekly schedule revolves around the department schedule that's right. just how it goes and it's not everyone else in the world's schedule <laughs> so it's very obvious like that it's different so i think that to always be talking about that right or just introducing them or maybe you visit them you know at work and you know they see the the station or the depart you know the trucks the cars whatever like any ways that you can connect them to the work because something you mentioned mentioned my dissertation something that 
kids who grew up in law enforcement families felt was really supportive to them was to feel connected to the department in the sense that like, I knew people's faces, I knew who they worked with, like I kind of understood what they did in ways. And when you're at home wondering what's going on, sometimes it's nice to know that like, uh, oh, they're working with so-and-so and I know that person and they're a safe person, right? And so like I can count on them and, and it brings them some comfort, I think to also know like that their parents spend so much time away, but they're doing something that they feel like other people, you know, we, we talk about we're helpers, right? And so like, you know, oh, is daddy home? Nope, he's helping people at work, right? And so like, I think it's helpful for kids to connect to a bigger purpose that usually the first responder is connected to. That first responder is is leaving. They're not missing your birthday party because they want to. They're missing it because they're, people need help. And, and right. you know, we kind of talk about like when my husband couldn't come home today, a way that we talk about it is like, he understands the whole, he could tell you all about firefighting, uh, maybe more than a probie, but he, you know, <laughs> understands like chain of command. And so when, you know, daddy was supposed to come home and he couldn't come home, we say that the chief needed him. The chief called and said, you can't go home. We need you. There's no one to maybe, you know, drive the engine or, you know, he just promoted. So he's not doing that anymore. But you know what I mean? Like, it's like for him to attach that, he knows what that means. Like it wasn't in daddy's control. He doesn't right. not want to come home and pick him up from preschool. Like the chief needed him because people needed help and there was no one there to do it. Right. So it's like, he's three, but he can understand that. And he doesn't get sad about that. It's, but if it's like, daddy can't pick you up from preschool today, I think he'd be sad about that. If that's how I worded it. Right. 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 You know, which is goes into my next point of like trying to build a resilient first responder family because the spouse spends so much time at home with the kids, just managing all the like, I can't be there. I'm going to be there. I'm done. It's like modeling is so important, which is why boundaries around news. If that makes you anxious, how I respond to what happens to my partner coming home, not coming home, going out is so important to like how my kids are going to respond to it either now or in the future, because kids look to us for information. Is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? Are we okay? Are we safe? And if I'm going, all right, here's the deal. Here's our plan. Daddy's not going to be home, but here's what we're going to do. That's a different message than like, oh, dad, he just got called out. Like, okay, I don't know what I'm going to do. That's a very different feeling. And I didn't say anything different, but the kid gets a different message. Right. You know, talking Body about language. different messaging and seeing things, John, you know, before the show, we had a chance to, to talk about, uh, you know, bringing first responder moms and dads into the classroom. You want to you want to talk about that? <laughs> yeah. Well, this is when we talk about the narrative and not so much with firefighters, because, you know, firefighters are always the heroes. And they're always the ones on the calendars. Unfortunately, us, us law enforcement take a backseat at the donut shop. But, <laughs> you know, there are, there are a lot of kids out there that are uh, families in law enforcement. And through the current national narrative that, that police officers are, um, the abuse that they're getting, a lot of uh, children are being bullied in school. They're being tormented because of the employment that their dad works at. You know, this is that same child that when they were in elementary school or maybe in, uh, in you, know, jun you know, well, elementary school, and they had the career day, and dad came in in the police uniform, and he was the hero, you know? He was the, oh, your dad's a police officer. Now, you know, fast forward a couple of years later, now dad's the, the devil, in some mm -hmm. some kids eyes, how how do kids respond to that? And or um, or your dad's a murderer, you know? Yeah, I mean, let's, yeah. let's let's call yeah. it like it is. This is what right. kids are saying to kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, mm -hmm. we're looking we're looking at a secondary trauma by what these children are seeing on the news and social media mm -hmm. with the narrative that even our politicians, some of our politicians, respectable people in the community, are saying about our police officers. It's not just the civilian aspect. Now, you know, they see they see a politician start saying something bad. They're like, oh, a respectful person, nice suit and tie, saying bad things about my dad or mom. Mm -hmm. You know, ha this that's got to so weigh heavy. That's got to weigh heavy. Of course it does. It does weigh heavy. And I do think that 
parents try to be protective and it's not only the kid, the, you know, the spouses, the police officers, right? Nobody wants to mention who they are, what they do. They don't put a flag, at least in California. I mean, I'm in the Bay Area. I don't know what it's like there, but flags have come down off of their homes. Flags don't go on their cars to, because they feel like it's a target. It's a target on their house. It's a target on their car. It's a target on their kids, right? So um, I don't think it's just the kid, right? The kid's watching the family and the family's going, okay, like, we're not going to talk about this, you right. know? And, and it's not just the kid. It's like, we don't want them to be a target. So we're going to have to teach them some language around this to maybe <laughs> sidestep that question or say something else. And, you know, I have teens that I see who, who talk about, um, you know, they're teens now, but they even talk about back when they were younger and going, oh yeah, I remember all the careers I used to make up for my dad. When someone would say, what does your dad do? They would just say something else. And now I don't know if that was a family decision. But even, him right decision. There, even right there, what you said, I mean, I, I, I'm getting that, that tightening in my stomach. I know I what you're saying. I that, know. You know, you, you, now you're telling a child to lie or, or skate around your dad or your mom's uh, it's a profession. sorry state of affairs that this country is. It really in. is. Um, and the way, it's the way really you hard. Just, you just said that, you know, well, don't tell anybody what dad does or what mom does. You know, right there, make advice. the child go, well, is he bad? Is it not good to tell him? Exactly. It's, it's such it is a so hard. Line. It's so horrible that we have to do that to our children. You know what um, was a slight protection was covid everyone was at home and kids weren't in schools. And I remember thinking, this is such a benefit to law enforcement kids right now yeah. where no one's in school while all this is going on because that would be really hard. So it was like, you could almost protect them for longer, right? As, as right. a way, and then now we're going back to school. So like, we'll see what, I mean, here at least it's a little bit, we're finally, you know, starting school. So, so now it's like, okay, here it comes. So this is all new a little bit. I said, this kid remembers back then. It's a different level now. It's a different level of territory. And I have heard of families recently talking about moving because they've heard of some things that have already happened with law enforcement kids being targeted by advocacy groups, advocacy groups, and, and taking it upon themselves to point out and target law enforcement and just kind of pick on them, right? And so right. Um, it's it's really hard. And what I'll say is like, the only thing, and I've thought about this over and over again, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I have a podcast called Code Three Families that is for um, first, res first responder spouses. Me and a best friend of mine, she's a police spouse and a psychologist, and I'm a fire spouse and psychologist, and we both have three-year-olds and now under one-year-olds. It's like the amazing. Our, our lives just parallel one another. So we talk about this all the time at length, how different my three-year-old is connected to the work and could tell you everything about firefighter. What his daddy's doing? What he's not? And when he got promoted to captain, he doesn't drive anymore. He gets direct. It's like this whole thing. And and she hasn't exposed her kid in the same way, being from a law enforcement family. And actually, you know, she kind of talks about it real, real on there. Just just saying like, I'm kind of holding off. Like I I'm not ready for that yet. I'm not ready. She doesn't want to like burst his bubble. As he's not in school yet, so she doesn't have to have, you know, different kinds of conversations. His dad's his hero, right? So she's like, I, I don't want to navigate this yet. So it's like, it's so hard and it's different for families. And um, everyone's comfort level is going to be different. It's going to be different based on where you live, right? And uh, it, it's just, uh, yeah, it's like, there's no good answer, but it, it's it's sad for these families for sure. When, when is the podcast air? Oh, sorry. Get sorry, it, when does the podcast Because I'm going to put it in the comments. So it's code three families with the number three and every Mondays is when it's supposed to come out um, in fire season. It's been a little bit tough with less time um, myself to, uh, you know, get to it and edit, but it's usually pretty consistent on Mondays, but you can, yeah, you can find it on any, any major time. platform. Oh no, just oh, no, Monday morning. Code, okay. Code three. It's families. not live. Yeah. It's not live. You can, you can go back and listen to all of them. Okay. All right. You know, and this does this doesn't only apply to our our firefighters and our police officers, our front, you know, the people that are out on the street. You know, this also applies to our nurses that are working in the hospitals right now, as well as um, you know, yeah, the the, the overstaff, the the understaffing, 
the 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 16 hour shifts within this pandemic so speaking to your child about what is going on and letting them letting them know from your point of view instead of them letting yeah. their mind do the what if is a much better aspect of it yes and what i'll add to that is that because we've talked about it at length and really thought about it the only thing that I can come up with that is probably going to be the strongest part of how you keep, you know, your kid really um, feeling proud is the relationship that that kid has with the officer. Because I think that once you start moving into middle school and high school, right, those are the years of identity and you're trying to figure things out for yourself. And if the message doesn't align with the feeling kids think differently. So if the message is, no, your dad, you know, is doing the right thing and they're doing, and, and it's like, this is the message from the family, but they don't feel connected to their dad say, and just they're distant, they're distracted. They're not, they don't ask him about that. You know, they're just gone. Right. I don't know if they're going to really side with that first responder when they get to an age of feeling like I get to make choices now, right? I get to decide what I think. So because I've seen this with kids who in therapy who have a great bond with their first responder parent and they that pulls them through those kids who say things to them and this is like a teenager and they'll talk about all the terrible things that these kids say and I go how does that affect you and they'll say I don't that doesn't matter to me I don't care I know what my dad is I know that he's you know and it's because his dad talks to him. They have a good bond, a relationship. He's proud of him. He introduces right. him to his work. So not, it's like a shield mm -hmm. to all of those comments. And that to me, was like, okay, this is it. This is the key. It's like that connection that you, you have that relationship because it could protect you from all the, the outside information. That's great. That's great. Now you had a chance um, with, uh, is it with Cal Fire to bring in, kids from ages seven to 12 and you did a huge interactive activity to help the teach the kids about managing and you call it big feelings. Big feelings yeah. Yeah. And coping skills. Yeah. What, I mean, what, uh, you know, talk, take us through a little bit. We've, we've got, uh, just a few minutes left but yeah. take us through exactly, um, what you did because this is, this is like where it gets tactical, you know? Yeah. So for people listening that could that could employ and you know try the same same strategies. Yeah, so I think it's just starting out with a neutral conversation about like being a fire family and we kind of talked about like what are your favorite parts about it, right? You don't always want to go negative and what are the hard parts about it? Not scary or sad, right? You're not influencing them. What are the hard parts? And and kids kind of talked about that and they shared and they brought it up and they could all connect because there are other fire families there. And then we kind of talked about, we all have big feelings and that's okay. And I call it a big feeling. These were kids seven to 12. So I call it a big feeling, you know, because it could be, I feel a lot of sadness. I feel a lot of anger, whatever it is, right? We all have big feelings. That's okay. They come and go. Um, but it's important to know what feeling it is and what to do with that feeling when it comes up, right? And how to make it smaller. So we kind of, we went over a little bit about, you know, choosing a feeling and um, talked about what level, like what makes you reach, like we, we have like a thermometer, right? And when you're at the top, like what gets you there? When are you in the middle? What do you feel like at the bottom? Because there's a range of this feeling. And we actually did a, an interactive activity. So they all had things that I sent, emailed ahead of time that they could print out and do. And um, it, yeah, and so they were kind of doing it with their parent at home and then we pause and we come back and then we talk about coping skills, which, you know, you use other terms, you say, you know, what are some things you could do to help you get lower on that scale, right? And so uh, they kind of came up and their parent, and I gave them a list of ideas and their parent helped them come up. And I had them commit to maybe three things, right? To try the next time they were feeling that big feeling. And this is really helpful for parents because parents tend to be the ones in the moment to come up with the idea, like, oh, you're feeling really sad. Why don't you go out and play? No, I don't want to go out and play. Why don't you go? Right? No, I don't. You know, the kids, not, it's, no, like I want to feel sad. So, you know, parents kind of like, well, what do I do? But if you, ha if you make something ahead of time, right, if you can predict it, do something about it now so that when it comes up again, it's their ideas. They came up with these ideas. They committed to trying these things. 
okay, what could happen? They try it and they go, that didn't work. So I try to tell parents, it's okay if it doesn't work. This is an experiment. You're going, oh, these coping skills didn't work. We chose the wrong ones. We got to choose new ones and we're going to try it again next time, right? So that they don't get really fixed on, um, no, I'm just sad and I want to feel sad. And sometimes you can just feel sad as long as you can come back out of it, right? So the whole point was just introducing like, Feelings are okay, they come up. It's important to know what brings them up, how big it is, and what we can do to help it like get smaller. And it's not gonna go all the way away and that's okay. Like we can still function when we're feeling a little bit sad or feeling a little bit angry. We all can, right? So um, maybe I should take this <laughs> a virtual activity with first responders. <laughs> You know, let's do sick that one. Like, it sounds about, like you know the EMDR, you know, where's your stress level? Yeah. It's it's the same, right? We all do it, but it's just it's helping put it in kid terms, in drawing, in coloring, in a visual representation that they can put on in their room so that it's right there when they're feeling those feelings, right? So and I just think with first responder kids, especially, big feelings come up frequently, right? Like they didn't come home, they missed this event, they can't be there. They And so it's like, it's important to have some language around what do we do when that happens? Sure. No, mm -hmm. that, that that's outstanding. I mean, the, the, the last thing you, you want is the, I would say in this, this day and time as an unprepared family, no matter what uh, first responder role you're filling and to have the kids as young as seven to have ownership in that and give them the power not only to feel the way they want to feel and tell them hey it's okay but to also have the parents on the flip side listening to this because it's not us as parents yeah. doing the activity it's you leading the activity and, you know, sometimes we just yeah. need a good, like, smack in the back of the head to be like, yeah. you need to let your kids feel sad. You need to let your, your kids, you know, yeah. if they if they need to run upstairs and cry, yeah. instead of okay. trying to fix it all the time, even though that's what we do. Yeah. Don't be a fixer. It's, right. It, uh, yeah. I, that is the great smack in front of that. It's like anxiety and anger, all those big feelings, your kids need to figure out how to solve it or else you will be solving it for them forever. It's just like if you never let go of their bike, you're training and you just hold held onto the bike, you're gonna be holding onto their bike in high school. So you gotta let go even though they might fall. So it's okay, you, you don't want to fix their problem every time. You can say, that's okay. You know, I'm feeling sad. Okay, well, if you've tried and they just really want to feel sad, okay, well, let me know. I'm going to go do this other thing. I'm going to get dinner ready. You let me know when you're done feeling sad and we'll do some coloring. If they really don't want to get, it's okay. Because for them to come around, that's so that's such an important step for them in learning how to regulate their own emotions. Right. You can't be the one regulating their emotions or solving all of their problems or they'll never figure it out for themselves, right? And it's yeah. within developmental age. But. Which brings us <laughs> into why kids you are know, the way they are. It, it's so funny because it's, funny topic. You say, it's so funny you say that because it, it just brings my mind back to that commercial that's on with the lady with the cat on her shoulder and the and the kid goes, Mom, I fell. And she's like, get a band-aid. And she's like, I'm bleeding. Get two band-aids. You know, and she's just like feeding the cat, you know, and not figure it out yourself. Yeah. You know, uh, yep. which is hard for a lot of uh new parents, young parents. Um, yeah. before we do, uh, and I do want to talk about real quick about the fire Academy and how you have been, uh, a positive effect on new first responder wives and spouses and husbands, bringing them into the fold and say, and, and gearing them up for what is ahead of their, uh, mm -hmm. first responder career. Yeah. Well, um, my book is kind of written for that and I've had departments purchase it and give it to new spouses because really what it is, is it's kind of like a guide or a manual that I wish was handed to me. Like I knew a lot of this information from school, but no one told me about it from the department. And I, what I realized is like, we're all just recreating the wheel. We're all failing, trying to figure it out, going, how do you do this life? Like what, what, how, you're not home for Christmas. You know, it's like you go through all these steps. So this is really like, 
here's what to expect. And here are ways to navigate those conversations. Here are conversations to have ahead of time and figure out what are we going to do about if you live in California strike team season, <laughs> what are you going to do about this? Or what is it like, um, you know, what are different uh, people in the, you know, like my, my husband just promoted to captain. I already understand what that means because we've had that conversation ahead of time. It's a lot more, it's like my promotion too, right? Like I right. have a lot more work at home now, right? But, but we had that conversation and knew it. It wasn't just something that happened. Like, and I always say, there's not a thing that happens for him at work that does not affect us here at home. So to not have that conversation and bring me into the loop, into the department, kind of like what's going on and how do we navigate this? to me is like crazy making because it's like everything that happens at work affects us somehow at home. Well, I just seen what, by you using the lingo, the lingo, the strike team. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I heard which, that too. Which, which is really cool because now if you're hanging around and go, Oh man, it's strike team season. And all of a sudden this new, new uh, spout goes, what the hell is that? You know, <laughs> yeah. so I they were firefighters, lingo, not cops. Yeah, right. <laughs> knowing the lingo is really uh, that's good, and it's it, I see that you yeah. know, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I kind of have to work with a lot of first responders. Yeah. It's Fire it's helpful, radio. which is helpful in therapy and couples therapy, right? Because what I notice is that when first responders come in, they're kind of resistant to couples therapy, but something that happens is like in there. I'm, I'm working on both ends here. Part of it is, yeah, maybe what's happening at home. And the other part is helping the spouse understand some of the impacts and, and how, why that's playing out that way at home. And sometimes the first response is like, I couldn't have said that better myself. It's almost like <laughs> they hadn't thought about it that way, but they're like, yes, that is what's well, that's happening. That's why sometimes we need that, <laughs> that set of eyes that's out here because since we're in it every day, it's totally. hard to have that right. separation. And let's just face it, after 12, 15, 18, 20 hour day, we don't really want to have that conversation. No. And so, um, yeah, you, you you do a lot of prep work. So can <laughs> Uh, I've got your website up on the screen. So first yep. responder family psychology.com. Can they get the book there? Yep. Yeah, you can get it there. You can get it on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. So um, everybody, uh, when the show's over, check out Rochelle's website. She's got a ton of information and you can sign up right on the homepage to have her blog posts delivered right to your email. So yes. it's it's automatic, it's scheduled, and it is really super interesting reading and prepare, prepare, prepare. That's the, that's uh, what I get from all of your stuff. It's like, don't mm -hmm. leave, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it, this isn't, this isn't preparing your family by the seat of your pants. You got to bring them into mm -hmm. the fold. And I love what you said about, uh, especially bringing the kids and making them feel like they're part of the department as much as you know we can, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. that's important. Um, yeah. You know, we always ask uh, our guests um, to take take a minute and uh, just give a message to all of our first responders out there. So, what would your message be? I think that it's important to know that, like I said, everything that happens at work, but for the first responder, it's like everything that you bring to work that makes you a good first responder sometimes doesn't play out so well in your relationships. And it's important to understand that there's a difference there. And if you find that it's having an impact that you do not want at home, sometimes it's just getting the insight on like how it's, it's good at work and not so great at home. And how do we make that transition? And sometimes it's easier than you think it might be to get that insight and implement it. Like it doesn't have to be this massive task. Like sometimes it's just like small stuff that you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, Rochelle, thank you so much uh, for joining us once again. And, you know, we're going to keep watching how your family grows, how your practice yeah. grows. Um, please let us know about all the new things that are coming out so we can uh, push that out through uh, a badge of honor on our social media uh, okay. streams as well. We really appreciate your time. Uh, we wish you and your family all the best. Uh, prayers go out to you guys for a safe uh, fire season and hopefully you'll 
see your husband soon. <laughs> Tomorrow, please. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank, right. you. Thank, Thank you. Care. Thank you. Bye -bye. So much. Take care. Bye. Okay. Bye. Wow, wow, wow. It you know, is, it's, it's just like on, 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 right? You know, so um, the fires in California, uh, I can't imagine, you know, the law enforcement went through the 2020 protests, the 20, you know, in the beginning of 21 protests, and they have to gear up all the time for these, you know, because you never know when a protest or a violent outbreak is going to happen and you're going to get called in. Here, they can almost predict when fire season is going to happen. So you have to kind of gear up. Um, man, it's it's not easy being a spouse of a first responder, but you know what? She brought up a lot of good things where, you know, uh, the what ifs and um, whatever is predictable is pre preventable. So to try to ease into the situation before it strikes you blindly. Yeah. Um, prepare. And, yeah. and prepare for it. Like anything else, yeah. be prepared for uh, the worst and hope for the best. And, Absolutely. you know, and try, try to do the best by your kids. Um, keep them in check and not even if you're anxiety written try not to push that off to your kids yeah yeah and you know speaking about speaking of preparing uh you me jeff and john we've done a lot of behind the scenes work in uh getting a badge of honor uh launched as a 501c3 we did it we are that um we have got a this is just the beginning <laughs> we've got a tremendous amount of work ahead of us and it's work that we're dedicated to it's what gets us out of bed every morning when you find your passion i mean it lights a fire and you're just go 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 and it's like yes yeah, sleep whatever and uh, no sleep is important sleep is very important yes but you know it it is it is a time right now to every for everybody to just take a minute and reflect. Think about the first responders, all of that. We're, we're back in school now. You know, the craziness of COVID, the craziness of our uh, the fires in California, the craziness of what's going on in the world in Afghanistan. Our veterans, you know, getting gut punched again. Everybody, we're all in the same boat here. We've got to support one another. We've got to be there uh, for one another. If you need find that you want to reach out, that you need to reach out, a badge of honor.com. We're right there to help. So you can scroll down on the home page. We've got a list. It's all by logo of every um uh 501c3 and more that we're aligned with that uh, all you have to do is click on their logo. Boom. You have their information, um, reach out because you truly are not alone. You have a, a family of, uh, wellness and healing, uh, around you. And we just want you to know that, that we're with you a hundred percent. Um, absolutely. And I'll, I'll be out, a big shout out to a DPD. I'll be out there tomorrow afternoon um, with the recruit class with uh, Mr. Hollywood, Jonathan Hill. Again, it, it's so very cool to uh, be able to talk about a badge of honor and let the recruits know, hey, this is the beginning of your career. Thank you, number one, for stepping up in such a crazy time. And number two, there's always going to be a time that you need to reach out and talk. Let's get the stigma, let's smash it, and let's start that conversation. Exactly. Uh, just so privileged that we get to be a part of that. Um, and to all the first responders out there, uh, we are praying for you. Thank you for what you do. You are valued uh, in our society and um, keep up the fantastic work. Again, you are not alone. Uh, and to all of uh, the veterans, you are not alone either right here. Uh, we're thinking about you big time to everybody um, that's still over there trying to get back. We're praying that uh, you will come back safely. Thank you for all your hard work and your dedication to keeping us free here so we can do shows like this every week. John, take us home. You know, uh, Rochelle said it the best, you know, what's predictable is preventable. So looking out for your healing is very important. 
And the best way to heal when we talk about resources on the 22nd of every month, come out to Heroes Bridge in Rockwall, Texas. We walk the bridge. It's an hour of uh, of chatting, walking, talking, just being next to family, friends, and supporters. And you, you'll you know it, you get off that bridge, and after an hour walk, you feel a little better. You heal a little bit more. Um, so if you're feeling stressed, come out, join us on the 22nd of every month. I know it's a tough time right now, but come on out. You're more than welcome. Kid and pet friendly. Start to heal with the people who are here for you. Amen to that. Amen. And until next week, everybody, take care. All right. Be safe. Thanks for joining in. Bye.